Yeah, good. Uh, I, I chose a really easy topic tonight. Uh, <laughs> why does God allow people? Uh, why does God allow people to suffer? Um, this is part of a, a larger project, uh, which called Truth Matters. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I went to a debate on the UNC Chapel Hill campus uh, between uh, Dan Wallace, who's a professor at Dallas Seminary, and uh, Bart Ehrman, who's the uh, head of the Department of Religion at UNC Chapel Hill, where my daughter Lauren was a student at the time. Uh, and they were uh, debating, uh, actually, uh, the uh, certain textual issues, why the Bible can or cannot be trusted. Um, and uh, so as I, as I walked out from that debate uh, that night, I, I decided that uh, you know, this was something that I cared deeply about. I cared deeply about um, uh, what students and college campuses in America are hearing today, especially in some of the you know, liberal uh, universities. And uh, I felt sometimes uh, students are only hearing one side of the story. And so uh, Daryl Bach, a friend of mine who's uh, the director of cultural engagement at Dallas Seminary, was kind enough to join me in that project. And one of my students, uh, Josh Chatro, who's now the uh, director of also cultural engagement, I believe is the title at Liberty University. Uh, so the three of us uh, worked on this uh, project, Truth Matters, and it's really, uh, be encouraging to see how the Lord has, has used that. Uh, uh, the, the publisher asked us to also then work on a, on a related project, Truth in the Culture of Doubt, which is uh, for those who are a little bit more advanced, who wanted us to give them all the, uh, the footnotes and all the academic resources for further study and so forth. So, uh, so together, it's been just fascinating. And so for tonight, I decided to just speak on chapter one in that book. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's a lot more in, in those books if you're interested, especially related to, uh, to whether or not scripture is true and reliable. But I think the one common denominator uh, is that of doubt or even skepticism uh, versus faith. And as I was uh, thinking through and, you know, wading through uh, some of the materials that were produced by the more uh, critical or even skeptical you know, professors who teach religion at American universities, uh, such as Dr. Ehrman, I came to realize that, that in many cases, uh, those scholars were not simply, uh, you know, uh, approaching a given issue, whether it's scripture, whether it's God, whether it's the deity of Christ, with, with doubt that was looking for, legitimately looking for reasonable answers. But they were actually uh, their doubt had hardened into skepticism uh, to the point where the bar is set so high, so unreasonably high, that almost no evidence could ever, you know, convince them otherwise. And that obviously makes dialogue, you know, somewhat difficult. Um, and so we'll see that tonight when it comes to suffering. Uh, what I'm going to uh, propose to you is that uh, our view, our world view, uh, beyond just quoting you know, a few chapters and verses from scripture really is the lens through which we look at life and through which we look at what happens to us, including uh, suffering. Now, for some of us, suffering is going to be a personal issue. And, uh, you know, just thinking back last couple of weeks, you know, don't want to bother with all the details, you know, little ailments in my life. But, you know, there's been a few doctor's visits, myself and my family, there's been a few little uh, car issues or you know minor accidents and so forth uh, but uh, I, I'm sure in, 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 in a group you know of this nature there's going to be some of us for whom you know this is not merely just an academic issue or uh, you know a philosophical issue but uh, you know we are acquainted with 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 major accidents sickness uh, maybe even you know loss of a loved one uh, and so forth. So uh, when I talk to someone about suffering, it's always helpful for me to, to think about, okay, is that a personal issue or is it more an intellectual issue? Uh, which is also very legitimate. You know, we really have some questions about how a good God, a loving God, could allow innocent people to be beheaded by fellow human beings or to be slaughtered or or for, for someone lose their, their infant, you know, uh, or, or, you know, 
suffering of that nature. I, uh, you know, I was more in that second category. I, uh, I went through college. I, uh, you know, in back in Vienna, Austria, as an unbeliever. I uh, graduated. I didn't uh, come to faith till my doctoral studies, um, and so. Uh, I had a lot of questions, and I was actually quite um, cynical, uh, you know, talking to, to believers. So God has been very gracious to me, and I, I fully understand for people to have, uh, you know, intellectual questions or even doubt. Um, and uh, by, by the grace of God, uh, I, I met a, an opera student on a train who shared uh, the love of Christ with me, shared the gospel with me from Galatians 5, the passage on the fruit of the Spirit and the... The, you know the deeds of, of, of the flesh and it just somehow struck me that that, that God's word was true so I, I, I bought a Bible and I read through it you know pretty much the next couple months and and for about six months I, I was absolutely miserable because you know I was trying really hard to, to do the right thing but I found within myself right as Paul tells us in Romans 7 that there was this other uh, you know downward pull you know by sin nature and so you know, I finally broke down and gave my life to Christ realizing that even though I didn't have all my questions answered at the time uh, I still had a lot of questions about the sovereignty of God and and, and some of the uh, you know relational breakups like my parents divorce and so forth but 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 I, I at some point decided to trust God it was not a blind leap of faith I had several uh, conversation partners who are very patient with me and who just you know many times would sit down and and converse with me but but eventually the time had come and actually one of them told me that he felt I had enough information I've been given <laughs> enough uh, evidence to to make a commitment and so uh, just to uh, and, and I by the grace of God responded to that challenge and I uh, committed my my life to Christ at that point. So uh, whether it's a personal issue or an intellectual issue for you, I look forward to to, uh, to give us some food for thought tonight and to, to talk about the, uh, the purpose and the meaning of suffering. Uh, I'm certainly not uh, a, an expert on suffering and uh, I don't aspire to be one. Uh, I, uh, uh, you know, there's no quick and easy answer, so I'm glad I at least have about 30 minutes to just kind of lay it out there and in the Q&A we can pick up, uh, you know, some of the details as well. I don't have all the answers. Um, I don't think anyone does, and Scripture does not give us all the answers, but Scripture gives us a framework and gives us many answers, I think, that are superior to those given by other uh, world religions and other philosophical systems of thought. So uh, I'm, I'm not a uh, philosopher or even a theologian. There's different ways people might approach the topic of suffering. I'm essentially a, a student of the Bible, a serious student of the Bible, and so I'm going to just primarily search the scripture and have you join me for that as I share what I found at the Bible, uh, what the Bible says about the nature of suffering. Now. Uh, it's always good to define our terms briefly as we look at a subject such as this, or any subject for that matter. And so, uh, in terms of uh, some possible definitions, uh, I, uh, I looked it up in you know some of the standard dictionaries. Uh, you know, forward the, the slide a bit to where it says definitions uh, of suffering. And essentially, we're talking about yes, the next slide. We're talking about. Uh, you know, adverse circumstances, there's obviously quite a range of adverse circumstances from rather trivial to, to extremely severe. Uh, uh, anything that would, would, would challenge uh, our faith, especially where there's some injustice involved, you know, something that, that can't be directly attributed, you know, to the cause and effect relationship to something that we feel like, yes, you know, this was just a poor decision we made. Uh, uh, but, but, but something a little bit more egregious than that. So we want to, to look at, at a biblical framework for suffering along those lines. And uh, as I already mentioned, essentially it comes down to a uh, world view uh, that affects how we, how we look at this particular issue. Um, and not just the nature of suffering, but also the purpose and the meaning of suffering. Because I think scripture gives us more than simply uh, a kind of a cause and effect uh, framework. Uh, time obviously won't allow us to talk about uh, all those uh, issues in depth, so I'm just going to say what is the biblical view 
of suffering. And so as we go through life, I think, and as we have that framework, we can process adverse circumstances. Hopefully, uh, we can be equipped to, uh, to respond in faith rather than in doubt or various other responses. So this is not even just for the mind. I'm going, going to end up challenging us to respond to suffering in a way that's increasingly uh, Christ-like. And at the same time, there may be some here who are honestly searching for God and who are searching for answers. And I want to address those and provide some answers as well. So what is a biblical worldview then? What would be some basic doctrinal framework that probably many of you are well aware of? But just a good place to start with God. Uh, God, according to scripture, is sovereign. That means that nothing ultimately happens that is beyond his control. And that even includes hell. Jesus uh, had a lot to say about hell more than just about any subject other than perhaps money. Um, and um, so uh, hell is still a part of God's uh, domain. Uh, it is uh, where people are assigned who have uh, rejected God's solution to suffering in Jesus Christ. And ultimately, uh, God is extremely grieved by that and is not his will for anyone to perish, as scripture tells us. Uh, but God has created us with a free will, and he's given us the dignity to make decisions that have real consequences. And that is just the creation that he chose to uh, bring into being, and that uh, includes hell. Uh, but God is sovereign uh, over all circumstances. He is loving, and he is good. And so if there's ever something that happens to us that is mysterious, we don't understand, if we have this framework, then I believe it will be a lot easier for us to, to respond in trust. Uh, secondly, uh, human beings. Um, human beings, according to scripture, were created as good, um, but they rebelled against the creator. And it is the same with creation. Creation was created good, but has also been corrupted. And so there's some, some broader uh, effects on creation, such as sickness or um, you know, other adverse circumstances. Now, uh, in some other religions, the creator-creature distinction is quite blurred, as you know, you know, pantheism or panentheism and so forth. But Christianity upholds a very clear distinction between the creator and the creature, and that's going to be very important, because I think what I see sometimes happening by people who approach scripture with kind of a skeptical mindset, or who basically charge God with being responsible directly for human suffering, is what they're forgetting is that God didn't mess up this world, we did, okay? And so to just kind of switch the blame and say, okay, we put all of the responsibility for the evil and the suffering in this world at God's doorstep, as we'll see, is, is not in keeping with what Scripture teaches about who God is and who we are. We messed uh, up. Uh, God created a beautiful world. So then, uh, in, in that uh, vein, why do people suffer? I believe there's at least three important things for us to consider uh, to answer that question. The first has to do with uh, Satan. Now, uh, sometimes when people see this picture, um, people laugh, all right? Uh, it's not easy, you know, to find a good picture to portray Satan, all right? <laughs> and there's, you know, when you look at whatever, you Google it and you look under the images for Satan, you know, as I do, as, as you might do, there's all kinds of really, well, you know, uh, the, the, the standard stereotypical pictures. I ended up choosing a picture that, you know, looks more like a, uh, you know, a congenial car salesman. You know, or, or somebody who, you know, he, he's, he's very shrewd, right? But, but, but he's likable. You see what I'm saying? So again, you might have chosen a different picture. But just to explain, you know, I picked this guy, right? Uh, anyway, so scripture uh, affirms the reality of Satan. And so I think not just the reality of God, but also Satan. Now Satan, as you know, is a created being, right? Again, he's a creature. He's not... The creator, who is eternal, right? Uh, uh, Satan is uh, not omniscient, 
right? He, uh, he makes mistakes. He, there's, there's things he doesn't know. Uh, he's not omnipresent, right? He can only be at one place at one time. He is not an equal match for God, right? Uh, like in some, you know, Christian novels perhaps. Uh, uh, God is, is the creator the, who is eternal, as I mentioned. Now, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis that I think uh, many of you uh, have seen, but it's worth repeating just briefly, at least the beginning of it. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Screw tape letters. Okay, so for our purposes, what C.S. Lewis is saying is that let's not ignore the devil. Uh, he is uh, real, and uh, he exists, and he is behind certain kinds of human suffering, especially in the case of unbelievers. Uh, uh, there's some uh, demonic activity that we should consider in a full or biblical framework for all the causes of suffering. But perhaps even more important is obviously the next one, and that is um, that, uh, I guess just a little bit more scriptural proof, but the book of Job, I would be remiss not to mention, is the preeminent book, a uh, biblical book that deals with suffering. And you know the story, and I think the real, um, from a storytelling standpoint, the really intriguing thing is that as readers of scripture, we hear that it's ultimately Satan who... Uh, ask God permission to tempt uh, Job, but Job in the story is unaware of that, and so you have this uh, interchange between him and his his uh, his counselors, his his uh, friends, uh, who try to uh, probe what the cause is, what the sin is that he committed, that uh, you know uh, why he deserved to suffer the way he did, and uh, only at the end we find out that. That uh, Satan really stands behind his suffering. First uh, Peter five eight is a good New Testament passage just to prove um, that Scripture uh, teaches that the devil, even for Christians today, is still something to be aware of. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That sounds pretty real and pretty scary, right? Prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone who's vulnerable. Even, you know, for, for each of us, there's, you know, he knows our weaknesses. In the Bible, in the Greek, he talks about he has methods. He has schemes, all right? He's plotting our demise. So uh, something to be, uh, you know, as C.S. Lewis said, not to be underestimated. Just like, uh, you know, in sports, when you're, when you're playing another team, you don't want to make the mistake of, of being overconfident. Uh, the second uh, important uh, element in a biblical framework uh, dealing with suffering is, of course, that of sin. And uh, just like Satan, also with sin, we don't like to think much about it, right? We don't really, it's an unpleasant subject, we don't like to really face the ugly truth and look ourselves in the mirror and, and, and realize that everyone in this room, right, we're all sinners. Uh, husband and wife, right, married to each other, are both sinners' parents, right? Sinful parents are trying to parent sinful children, right? If you're at work, right, your boss is a sinner, all your co-workers are sinners, you're a sinner. At church, even at church, your pastor is a sinner, right? And you, you get the idea. So, so we're living in the world where, uh, of course, in the Holy Spirit, in Christ, we have the power to break sin and to, to overcome it and to live in the Spirit. And that's, of course, very important. But, but apart from that, sin is a reality in our lives. Um, sin essentially, by definition, is uh, to break God's order, to rebel against God's order. And the important thing is, uh, as you realize, Scripture teaches us it's not just the wrong things we do. It's also that it has become part of our being, which is self-centered, uh, really ugly, you know, spiritually speaking, seeking our own self-interest, using others to our own advantage as opposed to reaching out to them in love uh, and in service. So uh, the Bible says that suffering is related to our own sin um, in the sense that 
uh, God has allowed us to uh, have the freedom to make decisions and to pay the consequences. Also, other sin. You know, when somebody gets in the car, uh, drinks and gets in the car and hits you, right? You're suffering not for your own sin, uh, but for the sin of somebody else. Or uh, ultimately, cosmic corruption. The entire world is really uh, affected, as I mentioned. You know, cancer or 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 other, uh, you know. Ebola, whatever, uh, it's all part of the, uh, ultimately, the, the fallen universe that we live in. Uh, so then, uh, just a little bit more on, on the nature of sin. I remember when I became a Christian, or, or, or you know, roughly around that time, I felt I at least deserved a fighting chance uh, to live my life perfectly and not to sin. Right? You can laugh now, right? Uh, uh, I, I wasn't sure it was totally fair, right, because I embraced this this radical concept of, of, of libertarianism, I guess, right? That, uh, you know, just because Adam sinned, right? How come I was already born in sin? Uh, at least so I thought at the time. But, but I think what we sometimes don't realize is that as a human race, we all kind of stand or fall together. And so scripture says, in Adam, we all sin. I think the truth is, uh, you know, if, if you've been there, you would have taken an apple too, whatever fruit it was, right? And if, and you know, or you would have also taken it from your wife and would have, would have, would have eaten from it. So you would have rebelled, uh, you know, just the same. So different uh, religious groups call that by different names. You know, Catholics I think refer to it as original sin. Uh, maybe the rest of us might call it total depravity, or the Bible just calls it, you know, our old nature, our old self, or just you know the flesh, you know, sinful nature. Uh, the idea that, you know, like David prayed in, in Psalm 51, that uh, in sin, my mother conceived me, right? So that the reality uh, that certainly outside of Christianity is not always uh, embraced and, and believed is that we're already born sinners. There's a lot of other religions and, 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 and belief systems that believe humanity is basically good. Or at least humanity is born with kind of a good impulse and a bad impulse. And you can just, you know, it's up to you to choose. Well, Scripture says that we're fallen. So unless God uh, redeems us, right, and, and saves us and helps us break the power of sin, we're not able, you know, to save ourselves. It, it, it requires uh, grace. So then, um, why do people suffer? Um, you know, why, like I said, do... Human beings, child, fellow human beings, heads up. Or why do wars get started? Um, you know, or anything in between. Uh, I think one of the best New Testament passages on that topic is uh, James chapter 4. So let me read that, let's find it for just a moment. Uh, it says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight. And quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Nobody has to teach a toddler or a baby, you know, to sin, right? They do it quite naturally. And so the point is, you know, when they're toddlers, they're fighting over some toy, right? Uh, when when people get older, we get a little bit more sophisticated about sin, right? But it's still the same heart condition. And so. Uh, you may have uh, seen this um, cartoon uh, written a, a long time ago, but uh, you know, Pogo, uh, it was originally, I think, on Earth Day. And so, uh, you know, we've met the enemy, and he is us, right? So it illustrates, I think, very uh, well uh, illustrated the idea that, you know, God created a beautiful world, but we sure have done a great job messing it up. Right? Uh, you know, the whole idea of the litter, and that's kind of a pet peeve in our family, right? The, you know, why would people throw out milk jugs or something, you know, out of the window when they drive down, you know, uh, you know a road and so forth? So I, I think the whole idea that, that it is the human condition that, that is really ultimately to blame for a lot of the evil and for a lot of the, the bad stuff that, that uh, we experience. So, uh, you know, You've heard it said before, and I don't know who said it, but, but, but it's very true. The heart of a human problem is the problem of the human heart. 
Is that true? The heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. So, um, the, uh, the problem is sinful, rebellious, proud hearts, and as a result, there's all kinds of conflicts. There's uh, um, litigation, there's broken relationships, uh, there's war, ethnic strife, um, and, and so on. Now, uh, mentioned Bart Ehrman once before, uh, he's a text critic, which means that he's looking at the different manuscripts, uh, especially the New Testament, and you know, looks at do they match up perfectly, and which one is the original, and you know, how, how do you explain the variations? But but he uh, uh, and he has a problem with with what he calls you know textual corruption of scripture, and he feels there's some problems with it. Uh, and he argues that you know in a quite learned way, I, I think there's there's a lot of problems with his, with his views in the details. But but. What really struck me in, 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 in reading you know, his various works is his book, God's Problem. Because in God's Problem, he tells us that his real problem is not really with Scripture. His problem is with a God who supposedly is good and loving according to Scripture, allow you know, all the, uh, the senseless suffering that, that goes on in this world. So uh, he's saying is, okay, God, are you in? Right? Did you show up for work today? Right? Because you are responsible for everything that goes on in this world. There's some element of truth in that, right? Because God is sovereign. But, you know, it's also true that, you know, the buck stops here, right? Uh, but is God really to blame for, uh, you know, what his creatures have done with this world? Is suffering really God's problem? Is it kind of like it's a black mark on his resume, right? He's got a, he needs to hire a PR agent like some politician uh, you know, who messed up. Uh, does, uh, does suffering somehow prove that there is no God? Now, on a, on a philosophical level, I'm told, and I'm not a philosopher, that logically, uh, there's huge holes in the argument that somehow because there's suffering in this world, that proves that God does not exist. As a matter of fact, I think the Bible makes it very clear uh, how uh, God can be God and can be creator and there is still sin and suffering in this world, essentially because uh, his creatures rebel. Um, but but uh, people like Bart Ehrman would then uh, say that, well, either God doesn't care, or maybe he's not even there. He would say either uh, God is uh, unwilling or unable to do anything about the suffering in this world. So if God is unable to act, then he's not all-powerful, and if he uh, does not act, or is I'm not unwilling, is unwilling to act, then he's not good. Now, uh, I would say that essentially this is a wrong view of God. Because, as I mentioned, we, uh, God didn't mess up this world that he created, we did. And so it's the kind of uh, blurring of the distinction between the creator and the creature that is in part the problem with the book. God's problem. Uh, God is not to blame. He's usually not the direct cause of suffering. And I'm saying usually because you might say that, uh, you know, certainly uh, on Judgment Day, uh, you know, Hebrews 9, 27 tells us that it's appointed for man to die once and after that to face judgment. So uh, in that sense, uh, God will hold each of us accountable for everything that we've done. But, uh, but, uh, God is not usually the direct cause of suffering. Um, but he is sovereign over suffering. And uh, he's using suffering to test us and to discipline us. Uh, I think a great passage on, on God's sovereignty in suffering is Genesis chapter 50 uh, and verse 20. You know the story, Joseph and his, his brothers, uh, uh, you know, uh, selling him into slavery. And, and toward the end of Joseph's life, he tells his brothers, "As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today." So, many years, right? In hindsight, Joseph was able, by the grace of God, to understand that there was meaning and there was purpose. Uh, and so, God is a God who is able to turn genuine evil into good. And I think only a faith perspective is able to look at suffering that way. So, uh, why do people suffer? We've seen uh, essentially three uh, parts of that, three planks in that framework. Satan, uh, sin, and 
the sovereignty of God. But I would say the question uh, still remains, for some at least, you know, because it's not just a, an intellectual issue, it's also a personal issue. Uh, God, does God care? It's not just about answers. And I believe the answer is found at the cross. And I love worshiping with you, and I love uh, some of the songs that we sing, because uh, even though sometimes in our churches we hear sermons on other topics, uh, the cross is really at the heart of the biblical message. So for those people who are saying, well, where is God? Why is God silent? Why isn't God doing anything? Well, God did something about suffering. He is the, you know, he, there's a lot of people talking about uh, suffering. There's a lot of people uh, who propose solutions to suffering. You know, but it's not going to come from the United Nations or from politicians who are talking heads on, on TV, right? Just because, in the end, the problem is the human heart. It's not just a matter of of political or social uh, issues, even though, uh, you know, my first degree is in economic and social sciences, so I do understand that, that uh, you know, uh, business and, and, and social relations are important, but, but I moved on to theology because I believe there's some deeper issues that need to be addressed as well. So uh, we see at the cross that God cares, and that uh, God cares so much that he took on uh, human form, right? The incarnation. Uh, Romans 8 says that he uh, took on the likeness of sinful flesh without actually being sin. So uh, he came to suffer, he came to die. And so we can look at um, the cross of Christ and that will tell us, um, you know, why he cared. I love this quote from Tim Keller. Uh, you know, if we look at the cross, uh, that will not necessarily tell us the reason for our suffering, but it will tell us what the reason isn't. It will tell us what the reason isn't. Uh, Tim Keller, one of the leading apologists of our day. So uh, God is sovereign over suffering, and it's a different kind of suffering. It's redemptive suffering. It is uh, the innocent suffering for the guilty, right? Uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Um, and that's the kind of suffering that, that an unregenerate mind someone who does not have uh, faith and who doesn't respond to God in trust uh, really has no framework to understand. Uh, so the cross was not an accident. It was part of God's uh, plan. And just a couple quick verses, Acts chapter 2, talks about that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Uh, God deliberately... Uh, uh, sent Jesus to suffer for us. And Acts chapter 4 is a very similar passage. Uh, talks about that that uh, the various political forces in Jesus' day, uh, you know, thought they made their own decisions based on political expediency and so forth. But in the end, God's plan, uh, his predestined plan, was carried out. Um, now, uh, why do we then still struggle as as Christians, when we deal with uh, adversity, I think it's important to be honest and to, to uh, you know, to realize that we still got a long ways to go, and often we don't respond to suffering the way we should. And sometimes there's reasons for that. I think one reason is that we often don't have enough information. Just like with math problems or with other, you know, we just don't know everything we would need to know. Like Job, we're sometimes groping in the dark and we're looking for reasons and. And I think there's some legitimacy to that. Uh, we don't know the supernatural uh, forces and dynamics that are, that are swirling around us. We uh, don't know the sources of suffering, which there's a certain complexity to suffering as well. There may not be a single cause, or <clears throat> there may not be a single cause. There may be multiple causes for suffering. Um, and uh, also, there may be doubt. So we may have, um, we may have some legitimate, um, you know, questions that 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 we're bringing to to God, and we may question the, the sovereignty of God, or the love, or the or the goodness of God. So then, uh, in terms of biblical answers, as as, as we're slowly, um, you know, winding things down. Uh, I would say that Scripture says it is very dangerous to assume a posture of critic of God. You know, the kind of 
critic, critical or skeptical stance that would cause a person to write a book like God's problem. Um, we see that in the book of Job, and we also see in Romans chapter 9, for example, which, uh, where Paul writes, But who are you, a man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded, say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Okay, so I think uh, it's a subject that we ought to uh, explore with reverence and with, with respect. Uh, essentially, to recap the biblical framework, God's creature, the creatures rebelled, and uh, God uh, made uh, and instituted what you might call free agency into his creation so that there are real consequences for, for our actions. And so that's important for us to remember. Um, and God chose, even though uh, his creatures rebelled against him, to, to not do away with this uh, you know, free agency. The, the problem is not with God. The problem is with our sin. So uh, when the fall occurred, there was no need for him to change the free agency. Creation was still good. There was simply a need for him to redeem his rebellious creatures. So uh, I think if, if there's nothing else that I want us to take away from tonight, it is that God does care very deeply for each one of us. And uh, he loves us and he's good. And when we don't understand, we can still trust him. There's one more thing that we have not yet investigated, and I think we would be remiss to not take a moment to look at uh, Jesus and Jesus' own words uh, on suffering. Uh, there were several places where Jesus was asked by occasion to, to, to address suffering uh, directly. And uh, one of them was in Luke chapter 13. So I want us to look for a moment at the... Uh, that, that well-known passage. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Uh, Pilate was known to be just a very uh, uh, brittle uh, procurator and Roman official who, uh, who did anything to, to make sure he, he brutally enforced Roman rule. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? because they suffered in this way. Uh, and he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So you see here, Jesus is uh, refusing to speculate or to, to somehow establish a cause and effect relationship between suffering uh, and, uh, and, and people's actions, but he uses it to challenge people to repent because we all are sinners and God is not... You know, and we're all under God's wrath according to Scripture. So, and unless we 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 uh, we allow Jesus to to save us, we are all uh, lost. And any uh, there's a second instance that Jesus brought up that was in the news uh, that day, apparently, which is the the 18 people um, still in the previous slide, just finishing up there. Uh, the uh, on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? He says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So if that were today, right, he would pull in some items that were in the news recently. So do you think that those 20 plus people who died in that Yemeni mosque, you know, were, were sinners, or the people whose, you know, heads were, were cut off by ISIS and, you know, were worse sinners and so forth? And the answer would be uh, no, but... Uh, we all are sinners, and so we all uh, need to repent. Uh, another instance, uh, you know, a couple more, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up, is, is uh, Jesus healing the, the blind man. And so there, uh, you have the scripture passage where uh, Jesus is talking about, where, uh, approached by his followers, and it says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So, uh, in this case, it was not the man's sin, it was not the parents' sin, but again, Jesus refusing to get dragged into this cause and effect thinking, but he affirmed the mystery uh, behind some human suffering, just the, the fallen condition of the universe. But he used it as an opportunity to show compassion, and to, to reach out 
and to heal the man. So uh, I think those are some priceless, uh, you know, just vignettes and glimpses of where you have uh, God incarnate actually walk among us and teach us about the nature of suffering. So how did Jesus deal with suffering? Just kind of giving you a few uh, summary points. He called on people to repent. He also uh, focused on, on, on God's glory and he adopted a redemptive faith perspective and I think uh, that should challenge us to do the same. He also reached out with compassion, as I mentioned, rather than criticism. You know, he didn't uh, question God or, or doubt God, but he wept at Lazarus' tomb, he raised him, and he held out the prospect of ultimate healing. And uh, that's the kingdom that uh, he came to inaugurate. So, uh, I already talked about why do we still struggle, but there's just one more question I want to briefly address. Uh, you know, whether you're uh, a seeker or whether you are a believer, and that is the silence of God. You know, times when it seems like God is not listening, when God is, is not acting, He's not answering our prayers, um, and it seems like if God is there and if He cares, and if He's loving and good, uh, and all powerful, why doesn't he intervene? I think that's a that's a uh, again a difficult question, and there's probably no one size fits all uh, response to it. I think one reason why God sometimes may choose not to intervene is because He allows uh, His free agents, uh, human beings, right? All of us who are created with uh, the ability to, to make real choices, have real consequences, to experience the, the consequences of our actions. And, you know, I'm thinking of Romans chapter 1, uh, where three times in rapid succession, Paul says, therefore, God gave them up, verses 24, 26, and 28. They're talking about, you know, sexual immorality. And so, when you think about it, uh, it's not that God doesn't care anymore. God does, isn't grieved, but he... he so to speak, he takes a step back and he, he just uh, sees that humans have hardened themselves against God. And I think a lot of that you see in our culture today um, with, the, uh, with the transgender uh, you know, revolution where, where people no longer accept the, uh, you know, the biological sex with which uh, they are born. And so God allows people, uh, you know, maybe they flaunt their, their liberty uh, to rebel against the Creator, but in the end, they're not so free that they will be unaccountable. Um, ultimately, uh, they will still face God's judgment, whether they even believe there is a God or not. So, the problem of God's uh, non-intervention. Uh, one other uh, important thing that I would like to point out to people is that, well, God actually did intervene, right? when he sent his son Jesus to die for us. So uh, God has not been silent, he's not been inactive. Uh, and uh, 2 Corinthians 5 is, is one of, I think, the key uh, biblical passage there. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I think that's the only real, permanent, final solution to suffering uh, of which I'm aware that exists. Uh, uh, at the cross, God's love and mercy and justice all meet. And uh, I read this uh, passage in, in, in Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 26 many times, till I finally uh, just was struck by the, just the amazing, almost paradox that you see there. Because, you know, God is holy, and so it's really our sin that separates us from Him. Uh, but God needs to punish sin because of His, his righteousness and His justice. And so... Uh, the solution that God found to be both just and to be the justifier of sinners was that he put all the blame and all the shame and all the suffering on Jesus at the cross. And he bore all of our sin as our substitute. And that was uh, what enabled God to be true to his character and true to his nature, to be righteous and to remain righteous. It would be righteous for for him to just let us off, right, without any consequence for our sin. But to put it on Jesus enabled him to be both just and the justifier of sinners. Um, so, uh, 
Also, God often does intervene today. You know, sometimes people uh, tell me, well, you know, the days of miracles are over. You read about them in the Gospels, but God doesn't do any more miracles today, right? Well, not so. I believe it, maybe we need to rethink our definition of miracle. Uh, I think many of us experience that God is intimately involved in our lives, and we see that in, in many small and, 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 and large ways as well that God uh, uh, cares. So God is still in the intervention business. He providentially cares for us. He answers prayer. Uh, he allows uh, his children to enjoy his good gifts, family, friends, and so forth, uh, find enjoyment in our work, in ministry, and so forth. Uh, God loves us, and he, he deeply cares for us. So with that, I promised you I would challenge you to respond uh, in a Christ-like and biblical fashion uh, to suffering in the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, what are some possible responses to suffering? whether it's Christians or, or not Christians. Well, uh, some of us may respond in anger or, or bitterness or uh, maybe discouragement or depression or even doubt. So those are all uh, responses. Uh, and maybe we can't control what happens to us, right? Like I tell my children, you know, when you play basketball, it's another sport. But we can't control our response to adverse circumstances. Uh, and so my challenge is for us to respond in faith. And so there's three specific challenges. First of all, uh, for us to respond by trusting God's purposes. Romans 8.28 surely must be one of the key passages on this topic. And it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Great verse to memorize. But don't stop with verse 28. You know, continue with uh, verse 29. That tells you what that purpose is. For those who, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So he wants us to make more like Christ in our character. Sometimes in our Christianity, we're more focused on what we do, right? We measure our spirituality by, you know, if we've read our Bible today, or if we've, you know, whatever, gone to certain meetings. And that's all important, but in the end, God is concerned with making us more like Christ. And suffering is a key ingredient uh, in that relationship. You know, in, in my life, always when I feel like, okay, maybe I'm, 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 I'm growing in the Lord, God brings something new into my life that makes me realize there's new uh, pockets of sin in my life. You know, I mean, whether it is getting married, becoming a parent, or, you know, a variety of other things, uh, accidents or other, other adversity. Uh, secondly, uh, share the gospel. Share the gospel. I believe some of the suffering in this world uh, is happening, uh, and God allows this world to continue, is because of his kindness. As, as Romans chapter 2 says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. So I think we can take that as an opportunity to, to come alongside people. Sometimes people are most open uh, when they are suffering, when they're hurting, uh, you know, for biblical answers. It's not going to be easy to uh, to explain to them, and it's not so much a matter of, of, of pretending to have all the answers, but we can share the gospel. We can lead them to the cross. We can we can comfort them and say that nobody's ever, ever suffered more innocently and more greatly than Jesus did for us. And finally, uh, hope in God's full and final future restoration. And so, uh, again, I would be remiss if I didn't end with, with the beautiful vision that the book of Revelation gives us in chapter 21, uh, which tells us that he, uh, Jesus, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be, shall be no more, neither shall there be a mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. You know, the other day I was, I was, I was going to work out, and I was in the gym. I hadn't been there for a while. So it was almost like I was just kind of coming up the stairs, and I was looking at all those people trying so hard to stay fit, right? It was almost like I had a bit of a vision, right? And God was whispering in my ear and saying, those people, you know, are all going to die. And they're all going to basically just try to delay, right? Hold off the decay just a little bit longer, right? Uh, maybe that's why Paul tells us in First Timothy that the physical training is of some value, but spiritual exercise, right? 
has value both in less of this life and in the life to come. So uh, maybe in this life there's suffering we can't understand, we can't explain. Um, you know, it causes us great grief, but, but I think, I know of nothing that's more comforting than to think about heaven when there will be no more death or no more pain or no more tears. Jesus will make all things new, and that's the, the hope that we have as believers. So let's, uh, let's close in prayer.